Hi, welcome. My name is Hilary Waldeck. I'm the Grove City College Archivist. Thanks for joining us today. Today, we're going to take a little look at how to be your own archivist of your family's history. Before we get started, let me introduce myself. I graduated from Grove City College in 2009 with a degree in history. I then went on to get my master's at Indiana University of Pennsylvania, um, a master's degree in public history with concentration in archives. I came to the college in January of 2012, and that is pretty much when we established the Grove City College archives. From there, in the last eight and a half years, we have been able to preserve and collect a large portion of the college's history, and we're continuing to do it on a daily basis. We also, as a small archive, get to do a lot of really neat things, like work with art, memorabilia, historical artifacts, including putting on displays and exhibits throughout campus. Hopefully, you'll be able to join us for our next exhibit, which will be during homecoming of 2021. One of the really important factors of working in the archive is getting to mentor and work with our student body. Uh, being an educational institution, it's so vital for us to be able to work with our students to be able to help give them the experiences that they need to be able to go on into the field later after they graduate. If you're interested in what the archive has, if there's something that you would like to personally research, um, feel free to reach out to us at collegearchives.gcc.edu. You can also check us out on the alumni website, um, alumni.gcc.edu slash archives. Or if you're on Instagram, you can see kind of some of the different fun things that we get to work with in the archive at GCC Archive. Okay, so let's get down to what we're really here about. So a lot of you are thinking, why should I be even archiving my family's history? Is anyone even gonna care? Well, the answer to that is absolutely. Um, genealogy is something that is growing tremendously throughout the world. As people are trying to tell the story of their family and that is one way to do it, is by protecting and preserving some of the items that you may have in your home. Preserving these things, not just for sentimental value, but also for historical value. They tell a piece of history. And so do not ever sell your family's history short. It is important. Organizing it can also help it be viewed better and it keeps it safer. It makes it so that it can last for generations to come. And it can be done by you. No, you're not a trained archivist, and that's okay. Um, if you have a very large collection, say you have a family member who left you a large collection of writings or books, something along those lines, maybe you should hire a consultant. But for the most part, a lot of you are working with things like scrapbooks, photos, letters from grandma and grandpa, things like that. That you can definitely take some steps to help preserve it in your home so that it can last for generations. When we're talking today, we're gonna to talk a little bit about storage. So that's probably your first thing. Where in my house am I gonna store this? You don't have a temperature controlled room with low humidity, and I get that, nobody does. And if you do, I want that. So probably the best bet is to try and find that location in your home that is the most ideal, that has a lower humidity, that has a more consistent temperature. Most of the times we're storing stuff in our attics and our basements. I get it. That's where I store a lot of my stuff too. But the problem is, is if you're dealing with older documents or a photo collection, those temperature fluctuations, especially in an attic, is going to break that down. It's going to make it more fragile and eventually you will lose those items. One good thing to do is get yourself a little humidity and temperature um, monitor. This little meter monitor can go in different rooms and tell you what the level of humidity in your home is. They're pretty inexpensive. You can buy them on Amazon, Walmart, Target, any of those kind of places. It also can tell you if your basement is possibly ideal. Probably the most ideal place in your home is going to be a closet or a room if you're displaying the items that is middle floor um, or interior room. Preferably, you don't want to be storing any of these items on an outside wall, as that is where you're going to have more of a temperature fluctuation. But closet space can often be hard to come by in a home, and so I get that. If a basement is the only option that you really have, if you are flood-prone to basement, you're probably going to want to make sure that you're putting your um, boxes or whatever you're storing it in up on a higher shelf so that if a flood does come, they are not going to be the first thing that is taken out. I don't love suggesting plastic totes um, like a Rubbermaid container, 
But if in a basement and you do have maybe some moisture issues or water issues, that tight sealed container can help protect some of your items. Adding some extra buffers of acid-free paper in there can also help. So it's not ideal, but there are solutions that you can do at home that will still help protect your items. I'm gonna show you a few boxes, but I'll also kind of show them as we break down um, item by item. So photos, scrapbooks, things like that. One of our most common archival boxes is one of these clamshell ones. Now, this is one of the most common ones. It's also really nice if you have a small collection. So you don't have that many items, but you still wanna keep them in a box, on a shelf, safe. This is a really one to, good one to go with. You're probably also thinking, where do I buy this stuff? Gaylord is a company that I personally trust and use in our archives. Um, there are several other companies, Hollinger, University Products. You can even find some of this stuff on Amazon. Gaylord is a really nice archival company that has a user-friendly website. It has uh, easy to search items. It has some of these resources to be able to let you figure out what exactly you need and gives you tips on how to be your own archivist at home. Some of them even come in kits. So for example, if you're doing photos or documents, they also sell kits to be able to kind of get you everything you need right off the bat. It can be overwhelming. There are so many different products and you do not need all of them. Um, you do not need to buy necessarily the best of the best of the best, especially if it's going in a wet basement because even the best of the best of the best still could get wet in a flood. Other options, so when we go on photos, you can also see some of our photo boxes back here. These are really great um, so that you don't have loose photos just in a giant box. There's also slender things that are really good to put up on top of a shelf. These are good for flatter documents. Um, they sell all different shapes and sizes. So if you have a comic book collection, they sell specific boxes just for comics. But again, if you're not looking to spend a lot of money, a Rubbermaid tote um, in the different sizes, they even sell photo Rubbermaid totes. So those are not horrible and also sometimes they do latch. So if you are worried about something falling or it's a high traffic area, maybe those are good options. Hopefully you'll be able to find different things in your price range. And really a lot of these websites will help you try to kind of figure out what you're gonna do. The next step is getting started with some of these collections. When you're working on any of your family archival materials, you wanna make sure that you have a table, a set space where you can work that is dry and clean. A kitchen table, a counter, as long as it's cleared off and dry and clean is good. Also, start slow. A lot of times it's super overwhelming. You have so many things you don't know where to start. Start small, work a little at a time. Be prepared to rearrange, arrange, and rearrange again. Um, but maybe start a little bit at a time so that you don't overwhelm yourself with a huge stack of things all at once. Okay, so we're gonna start moving into some of these collections and I will show you a few other supplies that you will need as we go along. First, I'm gonna start off with photos because photos is something that everybody has. Everybody has probably a giant box full of loose photos that you ended up getting from your grandma, your great grandma, your great aunt after they passed away. And so sometimes you know who these people are and sometimes you don't. Um, as you're going through them, you wanna start small, especially with photos. So I would start with a small stack at a time. Be prepared. So, you got your photo box. Another really good tool to have are the dividers. So dividers are similar to what you will use for documents, folders. In any of the supplies you're buying for your archives, you wanna make sure they are acid free. Acid free or archival safe. So oftentimes you say, oh, it's just a file folder. So I can just go buy that at Staples. Yes, if it says it's acid free and archival safe, it's good to go. But sometimes those office supplies are not meant to last forever, so they actually have a lot of acidity. So just make sure you're looking for acid-free when you're buying things. Photo dividers are a good way to start. 
set up a couple, start chronologically. If grandma kept them organized and she actually had a method to her madness, keep grandma's order. So in archives, we call that the original order, the original creator's order. A lot of times that has a story in itself and it is really good to keep that. But oftentimes, as I know I have, there's a giant box just messed up. So where you can start with that, set a couple dividers, maybe do it by decades, 1910s, 1920s, 1930s, all the way up to the 1990s. This way you can kind of start leafing in photos based on what you have. And then as you get a little bit more of that organization breaking down, then you can take those exact sections and start breaking them down by subject. If you have a box that is say all grandmas and then you have another box that say your aunt from your father's side, try and keep those families separate. Try and keep those family members photos a little bit separate because you don't wanna mix up that family line. You're also probably thinking, some of these aren't labeled. I have no idea who these people are. I don't even know what time period that is. That's kind of a fun investigation in itself. It's one of my favorite parts of looking at old photos. Take a look at the photo, look for hair, clothing, items in the background. If there's a TV, you can kind of put a timeline there of when TVs existed. Look at the cars in the background. Is it a carriage with a horse or is there a car? There's a lot of different things that can be a key indicator of the time period that that photo took place in. And luckily we all have Google, so you can kind of go on and you can search the internet to try and see what did hairstyles in 1920 look like. So once you have that, you can also kind of come up with subjects within those. So say you have great grandma's 99th birthday. So you'll wanna keep all of grandma's 99th birthday together in one section. That's where it's really nice to kind of have chronological because you'll be able to tell the story of your family from start to present. Also within there, label. So yes, there are gonna be people you don't know who they are, but there are people you know. If you know who those people are and you can label it, label it. Do not label it as grandma so-and-so or me because in a hundred years, no one's gonna know who me is. Please label your first and last name, label grandma's first and last name. With photos, with anything in archives, pencils are your best friend. You really want to use pencil in anything because it can be erased. It's not permanent. Pencil is your best um, choice for this. You want a little bit of a softer lead so that it isn't etching into a document or a photo. Now, some of these photos, pencil isn't going to write on. And I understand that. And that's where some of these archival companies or even craft stores sell items that are really good for the back of photos. So some of the options that you have too is if you have a, say it's a photo that came out of a scrapbook and it's a black paper on the back. A white pencil, a white soft pencil that's made for photos is going to do a great job of labeling that photo. There's also softer lead black pencils for um, labeling as well. And then if you are gonna to need to use a pen, say none of these pencils are writing, especially on the shinier, 1980s, 1990s, early 2000s paper, a soft tip um, marker or pen is going to be nice. You still want it to be fine. You don't want a giant Sharpie. You don't want something that's going to bleed through the photo, but you want something that is going to write on there. Um, and that's some of those items you can find on Gaylord. You can find them on Amazon. Some of them can you can even find in craft stores. But labeling across the board is going to be so helpful your fam for your family in the future. If you have it labeled, then people can go back and figure out who that person is. If you don't know, don't label it. But again, writing on your divider will help. I also suggest when you're all said and done, you've gotten everything pretty much done, create what I would call a finding aid and what we call an archive of finding aid. This is a full listing of what is in that box and pretty much the order. You don't necessarily have to do it item by item, but this will help if the box ever flips upside down and everything falls on the floor, you can help put it back together again. So now that we've kind of got a little handle on photos, let's move to something that's similar to photos, scrapbooks and photo albums. You probably have some version of a scrapbook or photo album in your house. And each one, 
is going to be a different level of acidity. Your early years, 20s, 30s, 40s, that's when this black paper is extremely acidic, it's very fragile, and it can do a lot of damage to those photos. So that is one that we're really going to want to take some care and time with. You also then going 30s, 40s, 50s, 70s, that's the time where you're gluing a lot of stuff on the paper. But if you look, you can see that the paper in here is very brown, it's fragile, it's highly acidic as well. So again, it's going to break down some of these items over time. You even go to the 80s and 90s. So many of you, I'm sure, have photo albums like this in your house, where you have plastic magnetic pages with the acetate glue that the pictures stick to. Hate to break to you, these are extremely acidic as well. That glue is damaging those photos. And over time, they will break down. Really, the only <laughs> scrapbooks that are probably can stay the same are the 2000s. Once we get into the early 2000s, that's when your acid-free archival safe materials really started becoming more readily available, especially for scrapbooking world. Those adhesives are far less acidic than any of the adhesives we're going to have in these books. You're also going to have more acid-free paper that's being used, and as time has progressed, it's continuing to get more acid-free. So once we talk through some of these books, if you do end up kind of rebuilding one of these scrapbooks, those are going to be the materials you're going to want to buy. Go to your local craft store, order some scrapbooking stuff, make sure it says acid-free and archival safe, and a lot of those items are going to be. So it's going to be a safer way for you to rebuild some of these old scrapbooks. What I always suggest before you disassemble any scrapbook is take pictures of it beforehand. Show it in its original state. Whether you're using a flatbed scanner, whether you're using a scanner app on your phone, or just taking pictures, it's a good way to kind of preserve how it originally looked. Some of these books are probably, you don't want to necessarily take apart. You don't have time to take apart. You don't really know where you're even going to start. So you just want to save them. You want to save them as is, you don't want to rip them apart, but you want to preserve them the best you can. So you're going to want to safely still store them in a box or something like that. Remember, acid-free is the way to go. Um, if you're putting in a plastic tote, possibly wrap it around with some acid-free tissue or leave in some paper to kind of protect those edges. Also, with those black paper scrapbooks or even some of these older ones, that have paper, you can see that that paper is leaching and hurting the photos. This is where acid-free paper is really handy. So if you don't want to disassemble your scrapbook and you want to leave it as is, I would highly suggest leaving in some acid-free paper in between the pages. This will help take some of that acidity from the paper and help protect some of these photos so that they're not going to leach onto the next page. Now, when it comes to acid-free paper, there are different types. There's permalite, which is extremely expensive. Um, you can pay for it, you can buy it, and that's fine. It's the best of the best kind of thing. So um, archival paper, permalite, is really handy, but you can also use copy paper. Most copy papers nowadays are acid-free. So if you look at the label when you're using it and it says acid-free, that is a good inexpensive way to help preserve some of these items. So that's if you're going to keep them as is, you're not going to disassemble them. But you can also look towards disassembling them and working towards either creating a new one or just taking those photos and putting them in a photo box. If you're taking the photos out and putting them in a photo box, I highly suggest you label as is and keep them in the order they were in the book. So again, you're going to start first page, put them in. You can even use dividers to separate the pages if you would like. You don't necessarily have to do that. But remember, label, label, label. If they aren't labeled in the book, but you know who they are, still label the back. With some of these ones that are glued specifically to paper, and say that adhesive from the 20s is still holding on strong, you may need to just let it go. If you cannot carefully remove it, you do not want to damage the photo. When removing, we use specialist fancy little tools. You don't have to buy this. Maybe look for a letter opener in your house that's a little on the thinner side. This might help pop up some of these photos that are about to give way. But if they are so stuck on, if there's nothing on the other side, it is okay to cut it off that paper and leave it on that backing. Because again, although it still has a little bit of that acidic paper on it, it's so much better than sitting in a book that's filled with it. 
you also have the option of completely rebuilding it as is. So if you're going to do that and you're going to remove all the pages, then what you're going to want to do is rebuild, keep it in order, keep things in order, and use those craft supplies that I've talked about that are acid-free. You can also buy them from Gaylord. There are scrapbooking um, and scrapbook saving materials on um, Gaylord Hollinger University products, those archival websites. So those are some ways that you can really help preserve those scrapbooks and make it so that they can still be used. Another option in this wonderful digital age is if you get good scans of them, you could actually make a replication of it through Shutterfly or all of those different photo book making websites. And you could have one that is able to be looked through and one that then is preserved. So then that way people are not physically touching some of these photos. Um, also when handling photos, I should have mentioned this earlier in the photo section, I apologize. You don't want to touch the photo. You want to touch the edges. You don't necessarily need gloves in archives. I know that's a huge, everyone assumes we're wearing gloves with everything, but you kind of lose your grip when you're using gloves. Gloves are really good for books. Um, they're really good for holding artwork, um, physical items that will be damaged by the oils in your skin. Um, you can use them when you're working with photos, especially if you have a tendency to touch the physical photo. You don't want that fingerprint and those oils to be on the photo because it can break it down. Um, but I would suggest instead of wearing cotton gloves for photos to wear almost like a medical glove because that will give you a little bit more grip. But again, holding the edges, um, kind of holding it based on the size is really good. Another option if you're rebuilding these um, scrapbooks is the little photo, photo corner things that can be glued on. Um, these photo corners, they stick on and you can pop the photo in. That's really nice because then you're not using an adhesive on the physical photo. I would suggest those even if you're scrapbooking on your own because it's a way that you're not gluing the photo down permanently. Say you happen to have a letter collection. Your parents wrote letters to each other during World War II and you have the entire set of love letters. The arrangement is going to be similar to photos. You're going to want to kind of keep family documents chronological order. You don't want a letter from 1942 and a letter from 1980 sit next to each other. You also want to keep the subjects relatively the same. So if you have letters between mom and dad, you want to keep mom and dad together. You don't want to leave aunt and uncle and everybody else in there, unless that is the order in which you were given them. So say your mother kept all of these letters and she kept them in a specific order. Again, we go back to that original order and you wanna keep them in that. Um, but again, so a lot of it is gonna come down to kind of trying to keep a somewhat chronological order and then you can also do a subject order within that as well. Documents can be tricky at times. Um, this is where a lot more preservation sometimes has to come in. Staples, they're evil. They're your arch enemy. Staples, paper clips, rubber bands, they're all going to have to be removed. Um, staples can rust. They can not only have the rust go onto other papers, they can and end up ripping. It can hurt the quality of the document and the integrity of the document. So it's best to remove them. Again, I use fancy little spatulas, but your fingernails can sometimes do as good of a job. A nail opener. The only thing you don't want to use is one of those pry open staple removers. That is the fastest way to rip through your document. Some of these are going to be in there. They're going to be in there so tightly and it is tricky. So please do me a favor. If it is so stuck in there and you're worried you're going to rip the document, just leave it. Because if you're going to do more harm than good, it is better to just leave it. Another thing is paper clips, fasteners, anything metal that is on those documents you want to remove. Rubber bands, mm. Rubber bands on photos, on documents, on letters, anything. It's disgusting. Over time, they break down. They'll go through a phase where they glue to it, and then eventually they become this dry, nasty thing that you have to scrape off. So if you can get the rubber band off easily, do it now. Then it won't discolor the items, it won't glue to it, and it'll help. If it is in that gluey, yucky stage, you might be better off just leaving it for right now. 
I know that it is damaging it, but if you can't get that rubber band off gently and carefully, you are more likely to rip your item. Another thing, when they get older, they get kind of crumbly. Those actually are pretty easy to remove, but go very slow, almost chisel away at it. Um, but oftentimes you can get with your foot, your finger. If it's starting to lift up the paper, if it's on a photo, again, leave it. If it's going to do damage, it is better to leave it there than do more damage that's permanent. Okay, documents, same thing. You can leave in the paper in between documents. So say you have a letter, for example. This letter comes with an envelope and three sheets of paper. And then you have your next letter that has an envelope and two sheets of paper. How do I keep these separate? Do I have to use a folder for each individual one? No, that is a huge waste of money and a huge waste of photos, or of folders, sorry. So what you wanna do here is always keep the envelope, first of all, because the envelope is a guide to the date. It is a guide to the person's full name. Maybe they had pet names for each other. Well, th their full name is gonna be on the envelope. So that is helpful to identify who the people are in the letter. It also has a, usually a stamped date and time on it, and that helps you arrange your letters if they're not good and meticulous about writing the date on their letters. So always keep the envelope and always put it first. It is the start of the letter. It is the first thing that you see when you open the letter. So envelope, paper, paper of the letter, then you can throw in that copy paper right there and that will separate to the start of the new one. That way you kind of have a little built-in divider and it's also protecting because that paper is probably has some high acidity. And so that way it helps from leaching from one letter to the other. Other options too, especially if you don't have a large collection. I, for example, have some Civil War documents um, that it's only three pieces of paper. It's not enough for an entire box. So what I use is polypropylene sleeves. Um, these you can buy actually on Amazon. Um, some of the office supply companies sell some similar things. You just wanna make sure again that they're acid free and archival safe. But this is really nice because if you have an especially older document, you can put it in there, protect it, and then put it in a folder. Say put it in a filing cabinet or a safe, and then you don't necessarily have to have a big box. They come in all different shapes and sizes. They come in big um, for, say, comic books, for newspapers. They even have them for postcards, for photos. So your really old photos, you might want to buy some of these and put that in there. So another document that you probably have in your house are newspapers. Oftentimes you're in a sporting event, you're in something and you cut out a newspaper article. Newspapers sadly are one of the highest acidity papers because newspapers are not meant to last. They are meant to be read that day, recycled, and you move on to the next day. So over time, they break down the fastest. Um, so that is one of those places where leafing in paper in between news articles in a folder is really helpful. Again, you're going to arrange them similar to how you would your documents or your photos, trying to keep them in chronological order. Um, if you have a lot of newspapers from one newspaper or towards one person, you could do a subject order and chronological within there. Um, but again, you're going to want to leaf in paper in between each individual article. If you have giant full-size newspapers, chances are you're not gonna wanna have a big giant box made for an outstretched open newspaper. Um, yes, having it open is going to preserve it longer. So if you did want to buy a newspaper box, they sell them and that's where you can have them laid out flat in there. Um, but if you have to keep them folded, it is okay. Yes, the creases will um, put strain on it over time, but if you are doing everything else in your power to preserve those, documents, hopefully they won't break down as fast. Um, you can find a lot of tears in newspaper. That's probably where you're going to find a lot of your document tears are within newspapers. Um, they sell document repair tape, but it is pretty expensive. And when you aren't as trained with using it, you're more likely to make mistakes. So it is okay to leave those tears unless you feel confident repairing that document. The only thing I ask is please do not use scotch tape. 
um, scotch tape, post-it notes, anything with that kind of a heat adhesive is not good for your document. It's not made for it. So if you are going to use a tape, I would suggest buying the acid-free archival document repair tape on, say, an archival website. Or if it is a scrapbook tape that says it's acid-free, it's a lot safer than using just a scotch tape. Some other items that you're also going to have in your house are books. Everyone has books. Now, books are one that oftentimes people want to display. So if you are displaying your books, it is best, again, to avoid that outside wall. If you have a shelf, make sure it is a good shelf. You want them standing up straight if they are going to be vertical. The taller the book, sometimes it's better to be horizontal. If it's tilted and on its side, it is going to put more of a strain on the spine and it can hurt it over time. Um, if it is an older book that has red rot, you that is when it's flaking and the leather is flaking off and you get left with just piles of dirt and disgustingness on your hands. Um, that is one when you're going to want to probably wear gloves and you will probably not want it next to other books. Um, you will want it to be protected. Um, if you are storing it, they sell book boxes, specific book boxes, and that is something that you could look into. Um, some of these other boxes also can work for books if you're storing them. Again, if you're storing them, I would do them flat instead of vertical. You can also take some of these folders and create your own little book cover. It's kind of like back when you were in school and you cover your textbooks with paper. Well, instead of using a paper bag, use maybe one of your acid-free folders and you can kind of fold it around. They also sell um, cotton, linen, dye-free, kind of like a ribbon as a string that can go around it. You really want dye-free because you don't want a color leaching into your paper or into your books. Cotton and linen is one of your safer and you don't want to do it too tight because you don't want to create indentations. Um, but that is a safer way to kind of preserve some of your books. Uh, a lot of books, it is very difficult to repair them. So that is where I would try to seek out more assistance. If you have a book, especially if it's a rare book, if it has valued much higher, that's when I would look into it. Um, but family books, family Bibles, they're so meaningful and they're worth keeping. So just making sure that they're protected and in a safer space in your house, in a good shelf, laying the proper way, it is going to be much better for their long-term longevity. Other items you might have in your house that um, we can also discuss today are artwork. Um, with artwork, you if it was framed a very long time ago, if say there's a glass panel on it, you wanna make sure that glass panel is UV protected. Um, so the more recent frames, most of them have a lot of UV protection in them. You want to check into that. Uh, local framer, even some of those craft stores that do framing, they have UV protected glass. Um, so if you go talk to the framer, they can help you and guide you into the proper museum quality glass. That way, if you have the picture hanging on the wall, you don't have sun damage. A lot of times what we have over time is sun damage. If you're going to hang a piece of art off, even if just family art and doesn't necessarily have a ton of monetary value, but it has a lot of sentimental value, that sun is still going to damage it. It can take the color out. It can fade the paper. So you'll want to have that museum quality glass. You want to try and hang your items away from the window, not in direct sunlight. That is the best way to preserve anything that you are putting on display. So you have an old flag, you have a, your great grandmother's wedding dress. Those are items that you do want to preserve. And that is where I would suggest investing in some of the bigger acid-free clothing boxes. Um, you can wrap it in acid-free tissue or you can wrap it in a nice cotton um, dye-free linen or cotton cloth. Um, and wrap it in that box and again storing it in some of the same locations that you're storing any of your documents or photos, protecting it, putting it up higher. You do want to make sure clothing is clean when it's going in. Um, if you have a tendency to get pests in your house like moths, um, putting a few of those cedar balls, cedar things that you can buy are also helpful to kind of distra distract from the moths coming and attacking your clothing. But again, making sure it's clean going in is going to be your best bet and also wrapping it up and protecting it, folding it nicely. You don't want to fold it too tight. You want to kind of have it a nice, even, flat 
fold. Um, some other items that you might have are VHSs, film. Those are much harder to maintain. Um, you do still want to keep them in a humidity controlled, temperature controlled room um, with cassettes and VHSs. They actually can stick together over time. So you're going to want to spin them. Um, that is one of the best ways to preserve them is spinning those spools. Uh, I would also look into digitization. A lot of places are starting to do it so that you can actually digitize your family photos and your, your family memories, your family videos. So I would look into them. A lot of times they're not that expensive. Um, even places like Costco, Sam's Club, they can sometimes do it for you as well. So that is an option if you want to try and maintain them because VHSs, all of that technology is starting to kind of go away. So you do want to get on that before you no longer have the opportunity and then it is extremely expensive to um, digitize those materials. And last but not least, speaking of digitization, some of your archives might already be digital. Taking care of your digital archive it also be complicated. You take a million photos, you have thousands of photos of your kid's first birthday. You can archive your present as well. Curate those Google photos, those iCloud. Make sure you are working to kind of keep them under control to a certain extent. Delete, go through once in a while, start at the very beginning, work your way to the present and delete some of the ones that are an accidental picture of your arm, an accidental picture of the wall, the really ones that you were a complete mistake and don't have any value whatsoever. Then you can also go through the ones that you took a thousand trillion of and delete the duplicates, delete the ones that you took and they all look identical and save a couple of the ones that really have the best photograph. And then that way, in a couple of years, you won't have millions upon millions of photos that you never go through, you never work through. It's good to kind of curate as you go along and get those more manageable so that you are more likely to save them. If you are scanning some of these photos, documents, scrapbooks, I suggest saving um, formats that are going to be saved and you can be used in future generations. PDFs are right now one of our standards that we can save in. TIFF files are another one. JPEGs are still good as well for a photo. Um, but saving in a PDF, especially for like your scrapbooks, your documents, it's the safest way to kind of save it digitally. Also, if you are taking the time to scan your photos, your scrapbooks, your documents, please back them up. Do not just save them on your computer because if something happens to your computer, you could lose them. So I always suggest saving them up either on an external hard drive, a flash drive, or better yet, a cloud service. So backing them up on a Google Drive, your cloud for um, your Apple, that's, that's perfect. Your iPhone can help you with that. Um, so saving that and having that backup is very helpful. And it's good to just digitize these things because a lot of times that's the best way to share it with other family members. So if you are looking for a good scanner, I would highly suggest um, Epson. They have a lot of budget-friendly flatbed scanners that are helpful. Um, but again, your phone can have, um, there are several apps that are good scanner quality apps that you can scan your documents much quicker and then you can go immediately to the cloud. Thank you so much for joining me. I know there's a million other things I could talk about. I hope I made this reasonable enough for you to be able to handle it on your own. Again, if you have any questions, please contact me at collegearchives at gcc.edu.